What is up, guys? It's me, Absolute Tier List Man. And today, instead of a tier list, we are going to be looking at the generic government reform tree of monarchies. So, um, if you have the Dharma DLC, um, essentially it adds the option to customize and uh, basically min max your country through a set of decisions. The reason why we have France picked here is because France has a completely generic uh, government reform uh, tree. Most countries will have the same options you see in front of us right here. Of course, as we go down, we will be discussing the pros and cons. And at the end of every tier, I'll be mentioning a special government reform that I think is pretty cool. If you want to see more videos like this for monarchies and theocracies and tribes, make sure hit the, to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. Before we begin, there's one simple equation that you should know that determines your monthly government reform progress. So this determines how much you gain per month to get towards the next government reform in your tree. This equation is 1 minus average autonomy okay so what does this mean okay this means that if you have for example you're one province minor since it's a capital it will have zero autonomy since capitals won't have any autonomy right that means you will be gaining one government reform progress a month that means you will unlock the first reform in a hundred months all right then for example, you have a country like France, who starts with an average local autonomy of 0.19. So that means across all of the provinces, the autonomy averaged out is 0.19. And because it's that, we gain 0.81 government reform progress per month. Okay? This is important because if you're trying to blast through your tree, the the fastest way to do this is by essentially making sure your autonomy is as low as possible. So um, when you raise autonomy to deal with rebels, keep in mind that this will delay your reforms. Let's start going down the tree. Tier 2, Noble Privileges. This one, 100% of the time, and I'm not even joking, 100% of the time, I choose Strength and Noble Privileges, right? Because Strength and Noble Privileges gives you 50% National Manpower Modifier versus Curtail Noble Privileges that gives plus 10 National Tax Modifier and minus 10 Nobility Influence. Okay, there's one main reason why you should never pick this National Tax Modifier over Manpower. Okay, and that's because manpower is more valuable than Ducats. And not only that, it's a considerable amount of manpower versus the amount of tax that you would get from this. As well as the fact that tax is the least scaling of uh, the money. Actually, gold would be the least scaling than uh, tax. But essentially, out of production, trade, and tax, the hardest to scale is tax. So... Um, even if you are poor, it's usually not, it's almost certainly not worth getting curtail the noble privileges. Um, and for that reason, I always go strengthen noble privileges. For interesting tier 2 reforms, we already talked about the Mughal Dewan, which is probably the strongest government reform in, t in the entire game, only available for the Mughals. Um, however, there is institutionalized the Black Army, which gives mercenary maintenance and mercenary discipline. This is only for Hungary. I also forgot to mention this, but we are not talking about revolutionary in this video. That will be a separate video. But um, yeah, you also have the Kenny Elites, which gives diplomatic free policies. This is only available for Muslim nations in the Indian technology group with Dravidian culture or Marathi culture. All right, and now we have tier three, bureaucracy. 
This one gives you between two options in a generic tree between centralized bureaucracy and decentralized bureaucracy. Again, this is one where I 90% of the time will pick centralized bureaucracy. This uh, decentralized bureaucracy I feel like is for special scenarios, um, especially in the HRE when you're stuck as a duchy where you have m a bunch of smaller cultures. The reason why I don't see a lot of value in this is because in a lot of my runs, uh, especially if I'm in single player, I usually end up getting to the empire rank especially fast. And when you become an empire rank, all of the nations in your um, culture, all of the different cultures become um, accepted cultures in your nation. So you don't need uh, you don't need to promote them. Right. Um, and for that reason, I rarely get decentralized bureaucracy. I feel like this is a special case where you have maybe a lot of cultures or maybe you're in an intersection between different cultures. Maybe you're in Russia, for example, uh, where or Muscovy, where you're stuck being um, uh, you're, you're stuck being a duchy or Lithuania. Um, and also in uh, the current state of the game, it only costs government reform progress in order to switch. So if you make uh, the monthly autonomy change you cho choose this early on later on maybe you need the promoted cultures uh, maybe to get the age bonus and age of absolutism you can just spend um, I believe 150 of your government reform progress on this tier um, and change it it used to cost 10 corruption or something like or 5 corruption something insane that made you never want to switch but um, yeah you, you it just costs government reform progress now and for special uh, government reforms on the bureaucracy tier, we have one again for the Mughals, which gives governing capacity, and one for the Dravidian culture or Marathi culture, which we saw um, in the third tier as well, uh, which gives governing capacity for maintenance, which is pretty considerable depending on your size. And then uh, we have two unique ones that are enabled by the Golden Century DLC. Uh, one is only available for Iberian countries with the ca uh, capital in Iberia with at least one colonist. So this includes Andalusia. So Portugal, Spain, Castile, Aragon, Andalusia. If they get one colonist, they can take this modifier. Um, it will pop up and you can uh, take it. Next, we have tier four, the administrative cadre. Um, this one, we have three interesting choices. We have administrative clergy, which gives administrative free policies plus one, clergy loyalty equilibrium plus five, clergy influence plus 10, uh, nobles of the robe, which gives leader cost minus 10, and then nobles, blah, blah. And then um, meteocratic recruitment, which gives advisor cost minus 10, and then bourgeoisie blah blah so uh equilibrium and influence um all of the same value right um in most cases um on like just in a void the administrative clergy almost most of the time is the best you can get a free administrative policy that's pretty awesome in the late game or even mid game depending on what uh, ideas you get however um in many cases the mediocratic recruitment is also valuable um and for some cases this is the difference between a level two and a level three advisor especially if you are stacking advisor cost modifiers you could use like a half cost advisor and not even with a strong economy you can boost up um, an advisor all the way to level five so there is value in this one i'd say the least one that i get is nobles of the robe it does save you 10 mil uh no actually it saves you five mil points per leader so uh, you lose you instead of spending 50 mil on uh, recruiting a general it costs 45 um, which it really isn't that much in the long run however um, you could argue that it could stack up especially if you're using your mil points to recruit a lot of generals so you can get professionalism to slack and standards um, you could argue that this has value but I'd say that this is the least likely on this tier that I would pick in, in many uh, in all my campaigns. Um, you could also argue that Nobles of the Robe is good for nobility loyalty, um, which you know it is five percent is considerable, um, especially since the current meta or the current state of the game having high uh, loyalty with your nobility is always a pro uh, priority so you constantly are getting the buffs that it gives you um, however i think that just like giving them estates or usually my usage of estates i usually end up with nobil high nobility loyalty um, 
let me know if you think otherwise. For interesting reforms in the administrative cadre uh, tier, we do have, again, um, for the Dravidin culture or Marathi culture, uh, state maintenance. And then for Mughals, we have another governing capacity. And then uh, one that I think is incredibly interesting is for countries that have the Marathas estate active, which is countries in India, there's a specific set of countries that have them. Um, and basically, you can it, gets, it gives you a special estate that gives you 10 discipline and minus 15 tax income scaled by Maratha land ownership. So, of course, you're not going to get 10 discipline because that would require 100% Maratha land ownership. However, um, you know, early on, this could be incredibly powerful if you just give your Maratha a lot of influence and give them a lot of uh, land by selling and give, having them the most influence, you could have a very strong army early on and abuse that. Next, we have tier five, the deliberative assembly. Um, this one gives you five different choices in the generic tree. Uh, the first being parliamentarism. So right away, you see minus one national arrest. However, this gives you the parliament um, and disables called Diet and also disables the nobles estate. I think in the current state of the game This is definitely a lot weaker than it used to be just because of how powerful the nobles estate is and How powerful the modifiers that you can get and as well as the privileges you can get from the nobles estate a very common one is strong duchies French has their own unique version of strong duchies, but um, strong duchies gives uh, normally two plus two diplomatic relations as well as minus ten um, minus actually i think it's like minus 20 the standard one minus 20 liberty desire something really high um and you need uh two vassals to activate this in normal countries that aren't france um yeah for that reason i think that this is definitely one of the weaker reforms in this tier the next is royal decree um uh, royal decree uh, gives only five absolutism that's all it does um, I rarely see myself needing that five maximum absolutism just because I always, uh, like 99% of the time, I trigger the court and country disaster in Age of Absolutism. And by the end of that disaster, you um, usually have over 100 absolutism. So um, I don't really see this necessary. The next is minus 0.3 yearly army tradition decay and I think I never get this one like very like I actually no I don't remember a single time I got that if someone in the uh, comments uh, knows or has like a good example or use of aristocrat aristocratic court let me know down below next is general's estates this one i see myself picking a lot of the times earlier on um or yeah most of the time i pick general's estates uh production is one of the stale uh, one of the two scaling um economic sources in the game the second being trade and um especially after the manufacturing um institution this right here could mean a huge boost to your economy um yeah, uh, but that's about it. It gives production efficiency. The next is states of general. Uh, this one changes your monarchy to be have a different unique government uh, that is similar to the Dutch Republic. Essentially, you have two factions uh, of your country. Um, I don't know if factions is the right word, but essentially you have the statists and the royalists. When the statists are in power of your country, you get a new leader every uh, four years. If the royalists are in power, um, you keep whatever ruler is in uh, ruling your land until his death, and then a new ruler is selected. Okay? Um, and that might seem like, you know, weird and it also gives you minus 10 stability cost modifier uh, just by itself however this has a very good use case um, specifically I've used this to um, integrate a lot of PUs incredibly fast so let's say um, your country like Provence a lot of personal unions right and personal unions after 50 years you have a chance to inherit so if you use states general and you constantly pick the statist um, uh, candidate you will get a new ruler every four years so even if for example your Austria and Milan has a 7% chance of integrating uh, of being inherited 
um, then if every four years you're getting a new uh, ruler, um, at some point you're just going to get a ruler and you're just going to integrate and inherit Milan for free. Um, and you can do this with bigger countries, right? If you're integrating Spain in the late game, you can use this, you know, you have maybe only 17% chance to inherit uh, Spain. Well, every four years you get a new, uh, you get a new king. So it's all good. Um, and for that reason, this is a very powerful um, if when it's used correctly, the states general. This tier actually only has two unique government reforms and they're only available if you have the elective monarchy government reform. So that basically means if you are Poland and um, the two unique choices that are given to Poland is that you can get plus one all monarch points for your local heir. So as an elective monarchy, your local heir is constantly uh, is the one that if you promote your own heir, um, he will always have plus one of every power um, when he is generated, uh, which might seem strong on paper, but uh, one of the main reasons why elective monarchies is so strong is because you can get um, foreign uh, foreign dynasties on your throne, so you can use that to claim other um, Christian nations, and you can PU them. So even though this is pretty good, it's like. It, you're not going to be picking your local heir if you're playing Commonwealth in the right way. The next is minus five years of separatism. And this one, um, this is pretty good, especially if you have this stacked with humanist ideas. But um, this can be very good when you're blobbing very heavily. Next, we have tier six, absolutism and constitutionalism, which is a funny name considering neither one of these have anything to do with absolutism. Um, but yeah, so um, the first one, c'est moi. I know I completely butchered that. You don't have to tell me. I know I butchered that. But um, it gives governing capacity plus 250. And then the other one, regional representation, gives minus 10 minimum autonomy in territories. Now, um, the this one right here, most people will pick. And I even used to pick this one even back in the day when it was uh, states. It would give you plus like five states or something like that. Um, and now that the more that I've been playing the game, if you're going wide, you should not pick this one. And that seems counterintuitive because you're like, hey, if you're going wide, you're going to need more governing capacity. Well, no, uh, if you're going wide, all you have to do to deal with governing capacity in the first place, all you have to do is spam courthouses in all of your in like most of your provinces. And that will deal with most of your uh, governing capacity issues. Um, and the thing is, it's actually better in the current state of the game. It's better to have a home region and then everything that you have downstream should be trade company. Basically, if you're converting it, convert it first and then trade company. It's going to give you a bunch more trade power and then you can also use investments to make your territories much more valuable while taking way less governing capacity and uh, making it easier to blob. So this right here, regional representation, when you're going wide, actually means that your territories, which at most like it's from the midpoint on, your territories are going to be more provinces than your home provinces, your stated provinces. Um, this means that you'll be getting double the money, double the manpower um, from your territories. So let's say when I was, um, or even my Persia campaign, because that's my most recent one, half of my country is territories. If I pick this option right here, all of those territories become double value. And um, I'm not going to get expansion ideas in my Persia game, but um, if you get expansion ideas as well, you can get minimum autonomy in territory. And um, in my Provence campaign, this actually accelerated me to such an insane amount of money that it literally didn't matter what I did. And I just had so much banked money that I could go into deficit for years straight and it wouldn't matter. Um, but uh, yeah, so this one is actually, this minimum autonomy in territory is actually incredibly valuable in certain situations. Uh, well, this one right here, of course, always has its value since, you know, um, in many cases, you're going to see yourself needing governing capacity. There are no non-revolutionary unique uh, 
uh, reforms on this tier, um, which is interesting. And finally, we have separation of power. Um, the last two options I'm going to talk about first because they're become a republic and install theocratic government. Um, obviously, this makes you republic. This makes you a theocratic government. Just keep in mind that if you decide to switch to government forms through um, through the reform tree rather than through event or through country formation, you will lose all of your government reform progress and you'll have to start from the beginning. And that's pretty rough, especially for a republic, which has, I believe, 13 tiers. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, we also have two other ones. We have the legislative houses and we have political absolutism. And legislative houses is like the one, this reform is sometimes I take it way later on in the game when I see myself having so much monarch points and doing whatever I want. Uh, the This one right here, political absolutism, I see myself taking almost every game. The Not just because of the maximum absolutism, which we talked badly about earlier before in the other reform, but uh, the yearly absolutism definitely helps you a lot especially when you stack that with yearly absolutism from having high crown lens you can see yourself going really high in absolutism uh, very fast again we see the same thing as the last tier there are no unique reforms on this tier uh, that are non for revolutionary governments um, again which is interesting well that's it for this video guys um, do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Is there some reforms do you that you usually get that um, I said that I never get? Let me know down in the comments below. Um, I really love the, all the input that you guys give and all of the basically discussion that we have, not only in the comment sections, but also in my Discord and how everyone's really civil. So that's really awesome, guys. And um, yeah, um, I value all of your opinions. So let me know. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.